Hi, this is Rodrigo from Frame Freak Studio, and this is the Creative Hustler Show. Today, our interview is a little bit different. Uh, so far, we have been interviewing many creative entrepreneurs who have made it either as a freelancer or as a, uh, an agency, and they have done it by their own means. But we haven't talked too much about people who have actually gotten investment in order to create their projects. Today, our guest is Tatiana Mitkovac. She's the founder of Claim Compass, which is a company in Europe that helps you get like refunds from airlines when uh, your flight has been delayed or you have problems with your package. And she has been one of the winners of uh, 500 startups. And she has been into many countries traveling the world. And she has been able to get a lot of help to pretty much fund her startup. So welcome, Tatiana. Hi, thanks for having me. So first of all, for the people who don't know about you, can you tell us a little bit about your history? How did you start your company? Uh, pretty much what drove you into it? Sure. So um, we started around two and a half years ago. And as you mentioned, what we do is helping passengers get compensated if their flights are disrupted, which means delay, cancel, overbook flights, whatever happens with uh, that, whatever goes wrong with your journey, we are the company to turn to. Turn to. So we've already helped tens of thousands of passengers. But uh, two and a half years ago, when we were starting, it was actually just a small project. Uh, we did register a company, but we were on three different locations. So I was living in Germany, my co-founder Valley was living in Glasgow, and my third co-founder Alex was in Canada. And we still had other jobs, or we were finishing up our, with our studies. Uh, but what we did is actually build a landing page, start validating, start getting our first claims. Uh, and that's how it all became serious, how we saw this is an actual opportunity for us to start a business and for us to actually make a difference, solve somebody's problem um, and uh, start growing from there on. And how was the learning process in order to learn that? Because like the inside workings of an airline and <laughs> pretty much how to get their money back from them uh, is not something that you learn, I think, from a school or from the university or college. Uh, how, how did you make it in order to learn about this completely, uh, pretty much pretty obscure, obscure topic that I, I think that most people don't know about. Yes, you are right. Uh, most passengers are unfamiliar uh, with this uh, regulation. They don't know that they have such rights. They don't know that this exists. And this is the problem we're solving. So we ourselves as founders and as team, we're surprised to know that this exists. And the great thing about us is that it's not actually dependent on terms and conditions of every airline. It's a European regulation that's applicable everywhere. So it doesn't matter if you fly from Germany or the UK or Bulgaria, it doesn't matter what your nationality is or which airline you're on, uh, you are entitled to get some money back if your flight is delayed or canceled. So once we uh, learned that this exists, our first idea and our first goal was to actually automate it, not to work as a law firm, not to provide a legal service, but to actually build a software company based on this regulation and uh, automate as much as we can from the process. So that submitting a claim can only take you a few minutes and then Claim Compass will take care of all the work. That's a really great idea. And in the beginning, when you started like getting the, the list of people who are interested into this, uh, what were the methods of uh, pretty much uh, marketing your company and letting people know about that you existed? Well, the beginning was tricky just because we uh, didn't have that much experience, but most of all, we didn't have resources. So we operated in the first few months, we operated without mar a marketing budget. So what we did, well, our first guess was maybe our first customers will be our friends or relatives or people who we spam on Facebook. Uh, but it turns out that it, uh, because of the strong marketing message, which is basically get free money if something happens to your flight. People tend to share that. They tend to speak about it. We got some PR out of it. We got um, some uh, social media activities coming from our first happy customers, which we didn't even know personally. And still they decided to share it uh, and to uh, tell more people about it. So our first few hundred customers 
did not come from paid acquisition, which was uh, great for us because it was a great learning experience. We got to speak to them. We got to learn how they found out about us. What did they think about the service? Uh, but then, of course, uh, when we started to generate revenue, our marketing uh, marketing efforts uh, started to be uh, much more mature. So we started having a real marketing budget. We started exploring channels like Facebook or Google AdWords. We started creating content, um, having some more PR appearances. So now it's much more comprehensive than it was when we started. And how many people uh, did you start this company with? Uh, because I think Something that pretty much hit me when I was learning about growth hacker marketing was that I saw that I saw some companies online, like Compound, Up, Interest, things like that. Then I was able to see some interviews with the marketing directors and uh, realized that many times, like the marketing team that they had were was like five people or less. <laughs> and pretty much they just by using this kind of things that you just talk about, like mouth in mouth and or incentivating people to talk about uh, their own company or inviting other people to use it, they were able to grow this uh, business idea, this startup, and, and pretty much bring it to many clients. So uh, how big was your team when you started out? That's a, that's a great question because uh, one of the things that will actually uh, matter really uh, a lot when you start your own company is who you started with. So who are your co-founders, which is extremely important. Uh, in my case, we um, have um, skill sets that complement each other, which is really important because on one side, we have uh, a CTO who built the website, built our custom internal software for processing claims. He's building our APIs, like our partner's API for travel agencies. Uh, then we have a person who has worked for an airline, our PR and marketing agency, and who is in, in charge of customer acquisition and growth. Uh, and then you have me uh, taking care of operational uh, like management, legal, and everything else perspective other than tech and marketing. So um, it's always great to have a marketing person on the, on the initial team that you started a company with and not to hire a marketing agency to do this work for you just because it's, um, as mentioned, a great learning experience. You cannot uh, build a project without being in touch with your customers and you cannot figure out which marketing efforts will be successful without experimenting what you're doing in the beginning you just need to uh to catch up to read a lot to get yourself familiar with trust but most importantly of things document your learnings and then uh, continue doing what works best so we at claim compass pretty much have this experimental mindset even now even uh, now that the marketing team is bigger and um, every time we launch a new landing page and we a b test it or we try a different channel, a different campaign, or a different audience. It's all about um, taking a look at what works. And most of the time, with this experimental mindset, you do have to scrap a lot of things. So maybe nine hours don't really work. So you just uh, uh, stop doing them, and but you leave what's really successful and what gets you more conversions. Definitely. And... This is like a mindset that, at least in the in the creative industry, I don't see happening a lot. Uh, obviously, in the entrepreneurship scene, it it does happen, which is like when I see creative people, they are trying to do everything. Like they are trying to do sales, they are trying to do marketing, they are trying to do art, and pretty much art endeavors. Like for you to get a good to get like. A, to be a great artist, you need to put like a really long time into doing this. But also to become a great marketer or a great businessman, uh, you need to also put like a lot of time learning and experimenting and all these things. Um, that's when most people get stuck. And this is like a solution, like, okay, like I don't have this skill, but I have this other skill. Let's join up, let's partner up with somebody who has 
maybe the salesman skills or the marketing skills or, or or something else and this is something that happened in my business as well like when we partner uh my business partner like he is the creative genius so pretty much i was able to wash my hands off the production and uh, of animations and things like that and i was able to focus completely on business and networking uh, and probably I could have learned how to find like really amazing artists and things like that on my own, but it will have taken a uh, way longer time. So <clears throat> my question for you will be like, uh, how do you find like a good partner who is compatible with you? Because I also see people who have tried to partner up and maybe they find out that <laughs> they do not match and um, pretty much end up the company before it even starts because of this uh, bad calibration, you could say. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's not just meeting the right people and teaming up with them, but it's actually the whole process of working together. It's just like a relationship where you have to be on the same page, you have to have a whole, the same vision to be going in the same direction. And then on your way going there, you also have to... Um, to push yourselves up, uh, each other up, to like be supportive, to be the best version of yourself uh, and to motivate your co-founders uh, to do that as well. And this is where some partnerships fall apart and this is where some companies break down just because the co-founders are maybe not um, a great team working to be done uh, bring out the best version of each other. So in our case, um, having weekly discussions on where, what are we currently doing? What are the results from last week? Uh, taking a look at our KPIs uh, and just um, being on the same page literally every Monday when we start working has been really important. Um, and you always have to make sure that everybody um, is on the same page on uh, what are you accomplishing? What are your next milestones? Uh, what is everybody's responsibilities? And this being said, if you eliminate this uh, chaos or uncertainty of a non-productive partnership uh, and you try to focus on productivity and uh, on the positive things of working together, then it should work out better. So pretty much communication is something that can help you out uh, achieve a lot, pretty much, right? That's right, yes. Also, uh, I saw many photos of you where you were like in events like Get in the Ring, which is uh, for the people who don't know, it's like uh, an event where somebody sets like a, <laughs> a ring, like a boxing ring, and people jump up in the ring and pitch their ideas. Uh, and I see you uh, as well in, in, in the 500 startups uh, kind of uh, a scene. So can you tell us a little bit about the events that you participated in in order to get help to fund your business? Yeah, so uh, in the early days of Clean Compass, just like many startups, we were really eager to tell people about our idea, to pitch on stage, to get the word out. So this usually gives you media attention or you, maybe you can uh, find your next mentor, advisor, a uh, team member or why not even an investor. So that's why we're doing some of these events just like Get in the Rink or Digital K or a bunch of others. Um, but what really shaped our company and how we develop is going through 500 startups. So 500 startups uh, has a few accelerators or like seed programs um, um, are in Silicon Valley, so they have one in San Francisco, one in Mountain View, um, and they're now opening up, first of all, programs all around the world, like uh, they just opened one in South America, and uh, they have microfunds as well. So their microfunds function as uh, small VC firms who invest in early stage companies throughout the world. So they actually aim for this global impact. They're not just a Silicon Valley program, they want to reach founders everywhere because they believe that founders don't just come out of the US or out of Stanford or Ivy League colleges, but they can actually be found everywhere. They can disrupt markets, even if they're not in Silicon Valley. So um, the experience of applying was a lot of fun. Uh, 
first, we didn't consider going through an American program just because our market is mainly here in the EU. Um, but second, we were we haven't really decided if we want to raise a new round and then just continue working on what we're already doing, or if we really need the assistance of going through the solid program that takes four months. You get connected to like ten, dozens of mentors. You go to workshops, so it's really intense. Um, we did, however, meet one of the venture partners um, at a micro fund of 500 startups, uh, just right at the corner here in Istanbul, uh, in Turkey. So they had just been created, they just uh, finished fundraising, so they were looking at companies in the region, and they met us. So we had a few calls, we shared our uh, metrics and our vision uh, for future growth. Uh, and they decided it would be a great idea to make an intro to their American colleagues and to actually uh, forward our application so that we can uh, consider being part of 500 startups in Mountain View. That's what we did. So we had a bunch of calls. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough because thousands of companies apply every year. Everybody wants to be in Silicon Valley and to... Uh, to be where everything's happening, where innovation is, uh, is <laughs> you meet innovation every day and you meet everyone. Um, but it was a hard process. It was um, a lot of interviews, high criteria. Um, unlike Y Combinator, 500 startups um, is actually looking into companies that are scaling up. So they don't just want to catch you at the early stage where you're still building and testing your product. They would prefer to have you on the stage where you're already generating revenue so they can help you. 10x that or 20x that. Um, so after going through the interviews, um, we were at a conference in Germany, one called Bets and Pretzels. Uh, it's a startup event and fun part about it is that everybody is dressed in uh, Oktoberfest attire. So you would see people in Lederhosen or in uh, like the traditional dresses. Uh, networking is just like drinking beer. So there at this event, um, I had the chance of meeting one of the other venture partners of 500 Startups. She's called Elizabeth. And uh, she had, I think, around five or 10 minutes uh, to spare for my pitch. So we were basically standing in a full court. She just had this limited amount of time and I had to pitch a clean compass. But uh, once I did, just a few hours later, we got an email from the interviewers and Elizabeth who said, okay, we exchanged thoughts and we'd like to invite you to join the program. Uh, so although we were focused on Europe, we were still fairly early. Uh, we had nothing to do with the American market at that time. Um, we still managed to get in and it turned out to be one of the greatest um, steps we ever took because then spending four months in California and then meeting so many amazing people, getting direct mentorship, just being able to um, to take on some of this mindset that is so much different than Europe, that proved to be very useful for, for our development. I definitely think that could be like a world changer because like you say, like this is Silicon Valley, like this is where everything happens, like all the tech startup is seen and being, and coming from El Salvador, like I, I, I do not know many people or I didn't knew back then many people who were like really hardcore entrepreneurs like uh, until you could say pretty recently, a couple of years ago and the first event that I, uh, like the first business event that I uh, went to was in Bulgaria pretty much. That was my first time in, in Europe. And I was surrounded uh, for one week like with all these uh, high achievers, entrepreneurs, and I remember having the kind of energy that I never felt before, like pretty much it was like my brain understood like, okay, this is like something different. We have to step up. And I remember uh, as well in the parties, like we were going <laughs> really crazy and we were doing all these activities. And then I came back to my home from that event and I was still like pump up for a whole week. And then pretty much I got sick because it was too much <laughs> and, and I got sick like for two weeks. But but I remember I never felt like that kind of energy. And I, I remember before that event, like I saw entrepreneurs who had this much energy. I, I had a couple of friends who were like in Poland 
and pretty much their day to day were like was like okay they woke up at 7 a.m went to the gym uh, went to eat then started working on their business then party in the night uh, go to sleep like at 3 a.m then wake up again at 7 and uh, and repeat all over again and i was like oh yeah like uh pretty much they they can do that because uh, maybe they are healthier, they have more energy or something like that. But that week in Bulgaria, I was doing the exact same thing and I didn't feel tired at all. And it was just because of all the energy from all these people that had changed something. And then I realized like, wow, like being surrounded by these kind of people can actually make, just by being there by osmosis, like, can make a huge change. Did you feel something similar when you were in there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our batch had around 40 companies coming from 20 different countries. So the energy was amazing. We were all in the same co-working space. Everybody was living in a whole city and Mountain View. Um, that's where Google is based, but it's basically a small village. So it's not a megapolis like San Francisco. It's not that busy. There's not that much to do, so everybody is just uh, hanging out in the office after work, um, having a beer, discussing their companies, giving each other tips. Uh, but it was really kind of a support community because whatever issue you have, you feel like you can share with the rest. Some companies maybe already went through the same thing. Some companies maybe can help you with tips or recommendations or just share their experience. And uh, this is really, uh, really great when you're a founder because... Your every day could be so stressful, uh, especially if you're doing this for the first time. And imagine just like taking care of your customers, but also thinking about partnerships and deals. Then also maybe fundraising, then taking care of operations, uh, putting on putting on fires uh, that come out every day. This could be um, kind of stressful. So being surrounded by other founders um, makes you feel like everything is okay, everything can be managed. Uh, there's not a single problem that. Uh, I wouldn't be able to sew. And it's just, um, as you mentioned, a great energy, um, a place or like an ecosystem where you wake up every day and you can't wait to go to the office, meet everyone and just be inspired by their stories. Nice. You know, coming from here, from Central America, <laughs> a couple of years ago, we started hearing about this concept of incubators and accelerators. And like, for example, in 500 startups, I see that they give you like $150,000, but they take like 5% of your company. Now I think it's 6%. Um, and I remember that there was a lot of skepticism in, in my country. Like, uh, no, like they are going to rip us off. Like they are going to scam us uh, because in here, pretty much we live with pretty bad experiences overall. So, like, one of the defense mechanisms that most people have here is, like, oh, if something is too good, then <laughs> then they walk out of it because they think, like, that, that is a trap. And then we met somebody from uh, a neighbor country of ours, like, on the rest, who actually got into a, an incubator in New York, and he won, like, 60... Yeah, sixty thousand dollars or something like that, and he went to New York for three months, and pretty much that's how his business started. And he was one of the biggest entrepreneurs over here. Now he's living in in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, but that's the first time that we heard that. Oh, okay, now we know somebody like who has gone through that, and. And he tells us that this is not a scam, that this is real, that they can actually help you uh, even more growing up in business. So for for the people who are a little bit skeptic about the incubators, uh, what will be your words towards them? Uh, so some tips that I can provide is first, you have to choose your incubator or accelerator or any kind of program wisely. Uh, just because there are so many programs that exist nowadays. So in every country, there are at least a few programs like this popping up. But really take a look at who is organizing it. What is their mentors network? Is this really the best added value that uh, you can get out of it? Because everybody knows that uh, Techstars or Y Combinator 
or 500 startups are great. They're just worldwide known brands and you cannot go wrong with them. But if you're in um, another country that's not the US and you're wondering if you should go through a local incubator, then just take a look at what companies have come out of there. What are the mentors? Um, is this specific to your industry? How helpful could it, could it be? Because it's not just about having fun, hanging out with other companies. It's mostly about um, just acquiring a great um, volume of knowledge or just like um, taking a look at other people's experiences and using their um, guidance and mentorship and advice in a really um, intense period of time. So for just a few months, you may go through like a crash course of business course, a business school or learn how to scale your customer acquisition or fix your operations or uh, start thinking about culture and hiring or find your next investor. And these are all very big steps for a company. So you need to be in the right environment to make the right decisions. And um, we were skeptical too, when we um, were wondering, should we get into such a program or should we go directly into fundraising mode and just be on our own and grow the company the way we wanted, we wanted to. Uh, but again, going through 500 startups has been one of the greatest experiences. It has taught us so much. And especially in terms of a mindset change and how you think uh, about the business and on the business, it has been uh, amazing just because of this difference between U.S. entrepreneurs with this global vision, with this risk taking, with this uh, looking at the bigger picture, making strategic decision versus most of the time, at least I feel like um, that's the case, European founders who are more, con more like afraid of uh, bureaucracy or regulations or they're afraid to scale that fast. They're thinking more in terms of a lifestyle business or maybe something exciting that they're developing, but it's still not making any money. So the American mindset is uh, really different than that, but I mean that in a good way. So even though it, for some cultures, it may sound like Americans are just working too hard or they are way too competitive, they think about money too much. Uh, this, had, this has a great side too, especially if you're building your own company, you can really appreciate uh, some of these lessons. So going through this program, just at the bare minimum, we just got in touch with so many helpful people that we are still in touch with. Um, even in, um, when it comes to fundraising, maybe you meet your investors uh, office hours of this incubator and then a year after they invest. Or when it comes to advisors, maybe somebody gave you great marketing advice and then it turns out they can help you along the development of your company. So uh, you get them on your advisory board. So it's a lot of things that will be incredibly hard to achieve on your own, just because you don't have the network and you, at least you don't have it in such an intense way. So it's one thing to have um, immediate access to hundreds of the greatest people in Silicon Valley versus to be on your own and to try to get in touch with them. Of course, maybe you can manage to do that if you're a hustler, but what if somebody just um, gave you this opportunity just because you're part of a program. Definitely. And when I saw like, uh, th this is more like a personal question. Uh, and I, uh, I pretty much talk with some of my friends who are also interested in, in applying to incubators. Uh, when we see that they take like uh, a percentage of your company, it's not like, Oh, here's free money, but they actually you have to give them some shares of, of the company. Uh, what was your experience there? Like, uh, pretty much, you have now a new investor. Uh, is he involved into helping you grow up your company, or pretty much do they leave you like to to the people of 500 startups? Uh, how how does it goes uh, from there? So 500 startups have a, st a standard deal. So it's not, they don't negotiate with every company. They just have standard um, uh, standard conditions. Uh, so they structure the deal as a convertible note. As you mentioned, it's 150K for 6% of your company, which is converted at the later stage when you raise your next round or when you exit or when a certain time amount passes. Uh, so we've even had cases of companies who already had a bigger valuation. So they already raised more money from other investors and they still wanted to go through the program with these conditions. So they basically downgraded their valuation just to go through 500 startups because it's so valuable. 
Um, in our case, they've been extremely helpful even after the program. So whatever we, whenever we feel like we need um, a connection to someone or we need some advice, uh, we do have probably, we do have Slack channels or an open network for all the previous batches and alumni. So um, everybody can just again share knowledge, get in touch, help each other, and that's what uh, the 500 strong community is all about. And here, Ricardo, sorry, but I just got a message that I just have 20% of my battery left. So if this uh, stops, <laughs> uh, we can continue on desktop. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, also, uh, what would you say that uh, are the most common mistakes that people make when they are starting their own business? that you see a lot of entrepreneurs doing, but that they are not aware that they are doing it? Well, a lot of people, first of all, don't choose the right co-founders, which is always unfortunate just because um, this is just so, so important in the recipe of a successful company. Uh, once you have the right co-founders, you can change your business 20 times. Like, this doesn't matter. You can always pivot, but having a great team is just... Uh, uh, the basis for for everything from there on. Uh, then a lot of people address small markets or markets that are hard to crack, markets that just take way too much time. So you're not able to validate if this is going to be a successful business in uh, a few months or even a year. Um, and a lot of people are afraid to um, to just tell other people about their ideas. So they're afraid of uh, going to events, networking, pitching. Uh, they just try to work on this project on their own, which most of the cases is just not the wisest way of uh, building this company because if you are all in, if you're building this company, it only makes sense that you try to tell everyone about it to get more partners, to get more team members on board, to get more customers. Just uh, not be afraid to share what you're working on. Awesome. Uh... Also, something that happened pretty much in, when I was in, in Europe there, I, I was trying to go into all these events possible uh, because I wanted first to meet more entrepreneurs, then to pretty much be in this environment to learn all these things that I didn't learn from my country because of the limitations here. Uh, pretty much that's how I met you <laughs> in a Silicon Drinkabout uh, in Sofia. Uh, but even so, I see people who uh, I, I talk are, again with people uh, in, in many countries. I even have uh, people from my own country who are living maybe in Russia or, or some someplace else like London. And they complain like, oh, there is like lack of opportunity. And I'm like, no, bro, like you are not looking in the right places. <laughs> Would you recommend people to go to be involved with more events, uh, to pretty much expand their minds? Absolutely. Um, still, there is a thin line. I know some people who just go to all the events and they end up not working on their business at all, which is uh, not great. But if, you, if you're doing anything in the startup world, it, um, it's just amazing to find people who are um, to have the same lifestyle as you. So maybe they quit their secure job, maybe their friends and family don't get it. Like, well, well why would you start a company uh, without knowing if it's going to be successful? Why would you risk everything? So finding like-minded people is always great. Inspiration and knowledge sharing is a second great reason. Uh, just because uh, if you spend all your time working, especially if you're on your own, this could be... Um, this could be kind of lonely, so it, uh, don't make it a lonely road. Just go to an event, go to sleep and drink about, meet other people who are uh, chasing their own dreams and uh, pump yourself up uh, from, from what they tell you. Um, and it's always about, it's like this saying that you should always be selling. So that's the same way, you should always be pitching, you should always be telling people about what you're up to because who knows, like next time you're hiring, they'll have a recommendation for a great marketing person or when you're fundraising uh, they may give you some tips for a local investor it's just explore this network and take as much as you can from it but also participate in it like contributing in your own way and this is what's going to make uh, an ecosystem like the small sofia startup ecosystem uh, a better one within the future 
has there been like a a failure in your in your path that you thought in the beginning it was devastating, but then lead you up to greater success in the future, or a favor uh, a favorite failure of yours? Um, not much a big failure, but a bunch of smaller like mistakes and failures. It could be hiring the wrong person and figuring out that uh, this is not working. This is not uh, taking your team to to a better level. Um, or fundraising and speaking to an investor who is not on the same page, who won't be a great partner for you. Uh, so sometimes you get this disappointing news that something didn't work out, but you figure out it was for the best because you it just makes you think harder about how to be better. It doesn't matter um, if it's you know, business development, operations, again, recruiting or fundraising. Um, but then you take the next chance to actually do it better, which always results in uh, you accomplishing more. So at least for now, it's been very productive. Awesome. Uh, this is going to be a tricky question, but was there something that you didn't expect at all to happen that actually happened and, and is really important in the path of entrepreneurship? In the very beginning, when um, we were not working full-time yet, I was um, positively surprised when my co-founders quit everything and just decided to work on this full-time because it was a leap of faith from all three of us. We just, um, it was a little bit about like burning bridges to the country you used to live in or to the job you used to have, to the security or you used to have, or even your social circles and just moving back to Bulgaria and establishing the company here. Uh, that was a surprise, like a personal one from me or from the co-founders. Other than that, um, I would say 500. We didn't expect to be uh, to be invited to be part of the program. When that happened, it was really amazing. On the other hand, what was something that you completely expected to become true uh, and became important as well? Um, well, probably almost everything else um, is we are a team that plans, that has uh, milestones, that executes. So we try to to plan what's going to happen and to not be that surprised when it happens because we actually worked on it. Awesome. Uh, if you had like a, a smart driven student uh, in front of you that is about to enter the real world, what will be your advice uh, to that person? To maybe uh, start working as soon as possible on whatever project he or she uh, wants to do. Uh, don't just stay in the academic world, but uh, try to travel, try to explore, take internships, take jobs, uh, just gather as much experience as, uh, as possible because studying in the library can be uh, really limited in terms of what you learn about the world. And um, on the contrary, so uh, traveling and meeting more people can actually answer very important questions for you and can guide you in the right direction uh, where you find happiness. I definitely agree with that. Like <laughs> uh, pretty much by meeting people in, especially in these environments, I have uh, pretty much solved doubts that I have like for months. And then by just talking about it, the, Maybe somebody uh, told me a solution and it was way simpler than I thought it would be. And that blew my mind a lot <laughs> when I was back there. Uh, also, for people who want to apply to incubators or accelerators, such as 500 startups, uh, what would be your advice to prepare for the pitching of that? Well, uh, try to communicate your idea in the best way possible. So don't bore anyone with a uh, half an hour pitch. You can say everything that's important in just two minutes. Uh, share what you've achieved so far. It could not be as impressive, but it's something. And just don't be afraid of being rejected. A lot of companies that uh, go into Y Combinator or 500 startups, they got rejected five times and they got in, in the sixth time. 
So uh, don't be discouraged, just continue working, improve your traction and uh, try and try. Great. Also, is there an advice that you would like to give that you think is not being told enough about in, in all these environments? Um, it uh, depends on which environment, but if we take Bulgaria, for example, I don't think people talk about traction that much. We're still at that stage where we get in and we get inspired by the idea or we tell stories about uh, solving a problem, but we're not that deep into uh, growth hacking or really successful marketing campaigns or reaching, like expanding to new markets, reaching more customers. And this is something that um, that is really exciting and that should be shared more as knowledge. So we should not just tell stories about companies or even the story I'm telling now. We should actually uh, get in the weeds and uh, start exploring what. Uh, made somebody successful or what made their company be a global company and not just a local startup. That is definitely a big truth. Uh, I also don't think many people are talking uh, about traction into the creative world. I think more people are like, again, just focusing on becoming a, a better creator and not thinking about all the logistics things about how do you take this work and pretty much make it a business or, or something like that? Yeah. So uh, is there any last advice that you would like to give that we haven't talked into this interview yet? Um, probably just uh, don't be afraid of trying and uh, don't be scared of failure. I know it sounds uh, like a cliche, but even in everyday life, a lot of people are not expressing their opinion or they're not uh, taking a leap of faith and just doing something that they always wanted to do. So if you try to stay out of your comfort zone just a little bit more every day, uh, you will end up being happier, even though there will be some difficulties on the way and some challenges. Um, but just surround yourself with people who, um, who want you to succeed and people who are interesting and exciting and uh, who have potential to achieve something more. And this will totally make your life different than what it used to be. Awesome. If people want to find you or your business online, where would be the best place to do so? Um, so Clean Compass uh, social media, they are more active than mine. Uh, you could just find us on cleancompass.eu. Otherwise, I'm on Twitter as at Tatiana Mitkova. And... Uh, yeah, if you check our social media pages, you'll be up to what's happening in the company or events that we're hosting, anything interesting. Awesome. Thanks a lot for being here and sharing your experience. It is really appreciated. Thank you. So this has been the last episode of the Creative Hustler Show. If you like this episode, please click the like button below and also share with your friends. Until next time.